Djibouti, a country a little over half the size of Switzerland, is located in northeast Africa in the Afar Triangle. With temperatures of up to 45 degrees in the interior, one of the hottest and most remote regions of the world. It rains only a few times a year. The lowest point in the country, 155 meters below sea level, is located in Lake Asal, while the highest mountain, Musa Ali, reaches 2,029 meters. Numerous plateaus extend over the north and east, often covered with black volcanic rock. Djibouti's capital, also called Djibouti, is home to 350,000 people, more than a third of the country's population. In addition, there are 50,000 refugees, mainly from Somalia, and 15,000 Europeans, including many soldiers stationed there in the fight against piracy. 50% of the native population lives in the simplest conditions, or in slums. The population is Muslim, the unemployment rate 50%. There's no regulated system of rubbish disposal in Djibouti. The government plans to develop the former French colony of Djibouti into an important transshipment center on the route between Africa and the Middle East and also a regional telecommunications hub. Djibouti is the main transit port for Ethiopian goods. <laughs> The Center for Teacher Training in Djibouti City. In a three-day workshop with German support, teachers, teacher counselors and environmentalists gain an important basis for school environmental education. Taking part is Aisha, who has already trained as an environmental educator in Landau. This cooperative project, unique in Germany in this form, was initiated by Landau Zoo and is officially recognized by the United Nations. Of almost nine to ten years of work... For the director of Landau Zoo, Jens Ove Heckel, a high point of his conservation work to date. NABU is a major supporter of the project through its support of the Federal Working Group on Africa program. Because of the model nature of the project in terms of environmental education and conservation in developing countries, it has been recognized by the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, WASA, as an official project. Now, made possible by NABU, the first teaching material is available. A student activity book about birds in Djibouti and a supplementary teacher's handbook, designed and written by Nadine Zielenbach, a teacher and zoo educationalist from Landau. Also der NABU ist die größte Naturschutzorganisation in, in Deutschland. NABU is the largest conservation organization in Germany. We have 450,000 members. NABU cares for the environment, but first of all, we bring environmental education to the people. We support the zoo in Landau in this involvement in Djibouti. Djibouti is a hot spot of biodiversity, and there's little educational material which can be used in schools or in public. So it's an honor for us to work together with Landau Zoo in such an important project. In Djibouti, there are no trained teachers for environmental education and hardly any training programs. So action-oriented information to implement environmental protection activities is particularly important. Using puppets for dialogue and descriptive material for working in the classroom. Nadine Zielenbach passes on some tips. Taking part are three French teachers who teach in French schools in Djibouti. The work with puppets is based on the activity book about birds. It's not just about knowledge, but involves the active participation of the individual children, as in this dialogue between a flamingo and the Djibouti francolin. Who are you? My name is Djibouti francolin. I live in the beautiful forêt du Dai, but the forest is no longer what it once was. Why? 
That you cannot know because you do not live there. There are only small numbers of us Francolins in Djibouti, in the Forêt du Dai and the Mabla Mountains, and nowhere else in the world. Do you think the student book is a valuable addition to the field of environmental education in Djibouti's primary schools? In your opinion, what aspects of the teacher's handbook are especially important? Where birds are concerned, the children are becoming very knowledgeable. They start by recognizing falcons or eagles and calling them by name. This is already an important step that we have made because you need the basic knowledge to distinguish between the various birds. Even our ancestors, who were nomads, did this in the same way. It's already a step in the right direction to be able to call the bird by its correct name, and we must pass on this skill to our students. This student book can easily be used in teaching general knowledge and in French or mathematics. And when I speak in an interdisciplinary context, of course I'm also talking about other subjects. It may be difficult to conduct the games in a large class, but if it's possible to divide the class in two, with half the group it's perfect, and I think the students would do quite well with it. The students always really like anything that has to do with learning by playing. In 2002, when I was attending a training course in Germany, I had the opportunity to visit Landau. Why Landau? The reason was that the partners of the conservation organization Djibouti Nature, of which I am a member, are situated and work in Landau. And they were the ones who made it possible for us to go to Germany and see the importance giving to environmental education there. The teacher's handbook provides biological background information linked to the student's bird book and information about birds and bird watching. The advice on teaching methodology and didactics is important. The book also includes copy templates, coloring pages, quiz cards and handcraft suggestions. To me, what was very important for the teacher's manual was to include background biological information, for instance, on the subject of birds. I know that the teachers go through just two years of training, and what is often lacking is the background knowledge. I noticed this again when someone said he only learned today that there is the Djibouti Franklin, a unique bird which occurs only in Djibouti and he didn't know about it. And these are elementary statements which once again confirm to me that it is necessary to first of all give the teacher the background information. In 2000, Hussein Rayale, teacher and ecologist from the conservation organization Djibouti Nature, learned about the zoo and zoo school in Landau. Since then, there has been cooperation between Djibouti and Landau. Here, he gives a presentation on Djibouti to the teachers, particularly the diverse flora and fauna of the country, which can only be preserved for the future if the population of this country, which is poor in other natural resources, acts in an environmentally friendly manner. A workshop with teachers and leaders of environmental clubs and schools, of which there are about 30 in Djibouti. Ornithology. How to recognize a bird. There's discussion about the feathers, the beak, feet and wings, for example, of a crow or a pigeon. Educational games with cards in the hand or on the floor. Everyone closes their eyes, a bird image is removed and must be guessed at. Or a bird's name is called out. Whoever has the card for the bird moves to a different seat. Another game for the classroom. Bird images lie on the floor and each player has a fly swatter in his hand. 
The game leader calls out the name of a bird for the round, and the players swat the matching image. The quickest wins. <laughs> Education plays an increasingly important role in the fight against illiteracy and poverty, also in Djibouti. Even so, 32% of those over 14 years of age can neither read nor write. Future teachers attend this training center for two years, at the end of which they are trained primary school teachers. The stimulating learning games continue outdoors. Four people are each responsible for building a nest for a bird species of their choosing. <laughs> We have one minute and we'll see who has fed their little chicks well. That means who has gathered a lot of worms. We start now. Quick, quick. <coughs> one guards the nest so that no nest materials are stolen. When the nest is ready, the search for food begins. The clock is ticking. <laughs> Nest building, foraging, defense. And all with only the beak. Eating with chopsticks shows how difficult it can be to eat with a beak. <laughs> Learning station. Not everyone speaks the local languages of French or Arabic. These feathers are at the body, like this, to keep the bird warm. A bit. This feather for flying doesn't work. It's not the body, but this is for flying. Okay. And this is also interesting. The, the structure of the feather. You see, there is this hooks. Yeah? And you can feel it. If you tear a little... Using a magnifying glass, the structure and variations can be seen. Another station, birds' feet and their purpose. By means of the web between the toes, the birds can make better progress through the water. Since only a few schools are equipped with copiers, the teachers here are practicing drawing birds. Stimulation comes from the student activity book. Drawing paper and felt pens are available, but admittedly not in all of Djibouti's schools. C'est vrai que bon, l'éducation à l'environnement n'est pas une nouveauté dans ce cadre-là. It's true that general education in this context is not a novelty because it's already there. The only problem is that a few years ago there was a reform and the political decision was made to teach more Arabic. So the teaching time was split between Arabic and French and time for the interdisciplinary subjects such as environmental content in general education, has been reduced. But all interdisciplinary teaching, environmental education or hygiene, still has a place in education, especially in primary schools. After three days, the group from Landau leaves the city and spends a further three days in the mountains. Hussein Rayale from Djibouti Nature organizes the trip. It's about 150 kilometers to Forêt du Daille. A week at one of the ends of the earth. The population of Djibouti is composed of the ethnic groups of the Somali Issa and the Afar in the ratio of 55 to 40 percent. The majority belong to nomadic tribes who live mainly from goat or camel breeding. A barren land, a lot of volcanic rock, but also highly adapted wildlife species. Permanent vegetation is found in only some parts of the country, such as the mountains in the north. 
We are here where we called Gubet, Gubet al Karab, and in the local uh, explanation, we say here the capital city of the devil empire of the world. Why this? Because it's a rift. It's a part of the, this great African rift valley. And it's where the continent will be cut at the split. On the way to Forêt du Dai in the Goda Mountains, it's the only remaining large forest in Djibouti, covering about 25 square kilometers at an altitude of 1,500 meters. It rains twice in good years, otherwise the wind pushes moist air from the sea to the mountains. But the Forêt du Dai is now under threat of drying out, in particular the once majestic juniper trees have suffered heavy damage, while boxwood can be seen more often. More trees are dead. If you look there, all the dead trees, uh, what is your feeling? I mean, you inspect the forest more often than I do, but this is my first impression. Yes, of course, uh, compared to your first visit in 2001 and up to now, it's almost, as you said, 10 years uh, round. And uh, as we can see, all the dead trees are the juniper because the, the spot, the green spot, are the boxes. Mm -hmm. And in 2001, when you came, all of them were, there was a dead trees also mm -hmm. inside, but more majority were alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, uh, there was a drought. Mm -hmm. Three years, no rain. The juniper forest in Forêt du Dai is the only habitat of the critically endangered Djibouti francolin, a type of wild fowl found only in Djibouti. It is estimated that only about 700 specimens of this endemic bird live here in the rugged mountains. It is very difficult to sight the shy birds. The endangered juniper francolin feeds on seeds, insects, tender leaves and berries. The brown-grey to pale brown feathers provide excellent camouflage for the around 35 centimeter bird. And yet the film team manages to get what is probably a very rare recording. Not only this rare bird is fascinating, the forest is also the habitat of many other species. These include small reptiles, such as this gecko, sending out signals. The mammals include the rabbit-sized herbivorous rock hyrax, a skilled climber and close relative of the elephant. For Hussein, the experienced ecologist, there's always something new to discover. Here, a special insect. He's spellbound while watching a praying mantis. Especially when it comes to the smaller species, the remote forest could still have something as yet undiscovered in store for the experts. As community health police always on the lookout for something edible, a fan-tailed raven soars above the ravines. And an Egyptian vulture keeps watch from his lookout. Perhaps the red-backed shrike, a winter visitor from Europe, is drawn to the Forêt du Dai to gather strength before returning to its European breeding grounds. Just like the various magnificently feathered wagtails, here busily searching for insects. Djibouti is a bird paradise with over 365 different bird species. And because it's on the migration route from Eurasia to Africa, every year in autumn there are an additional 500,000 to 1 million migratory birds to be seen. A real stunt pilot, the African drongo with its distinctive forked tail. Instantly recognizable by its reputation and its conspicuous tuft of feathers, a hoopoe. The common bulbuls, like this couple, are still frequently seen. Fruits and small insects are on the menu. Whether the Hemprich's hornbill can remain long term depends on him finding nesting holes in old trees in the future. Climate change brings more heat and drought, leading to the death of the forest. 
exacerbated by the constant grazing of goats, sheep and cattle that trample and eat the young trees. On the initiative of the local conservation organization Djibouti Nature and the local community, some parts of the forest were fenced off in order to protect them from grazing animals. Unfortunately, there are always setbacks. Ja, eigentlich müsste diese Tür zu diesem eingezäunten Waldstück zu sein. Actually, the door to this fenced-off area of forest should be closed. But as you can see, everyone has access, unfortunately including cattle, goats and camels. And the great hope we had for at least the fenced areas in this totally degraded forest, each at least one hectare of land, was that the ground vegetation, the young trees, could still regenerate. But you see from this situation, a lot of money has been paid out to build this fence, but obviously it's still either not accepted or not understood by the people. So here too, environmental education must be directed towards generating understanding as to why it is important for the protection of the forest to prevent at least some of the continuous grazing, logging and wood gathering. What can be done? It's hard to know. Now, of course, we have to think about the the therapy, how to save the rest uh, of the forest. And uh, we, of course, have a Discussion. example uh, with the fenced area, which often obviously doesn't work currently. It could work if the fence would really be closed. It's a long process that the community understand because it's why in my site and uh, maybe very few people from the community we are doing. It's why we are doing this environmental education. Because the elders, they have their own things fixed already. And it's difficult. The Landau group continues on to a simple tourist camp near Forêt du Dai, the starting point for forest excursions and village visits. The inhabitants of Dai village and nine further settlements are members of different clans of Afa, which once roamed as proud nomads and now have settled, dispersed under modest conditions. Since 2003, their water supply is assured by wells and pumps, although the volume of water is limited. All villages receive food aid. Hussein and the German environmentalists visit the head of the Dai community. The village elder speaks Afar. <laughs> Ali, the head of the primary school in Forêt du Dai, translates from Afar into French. He thanks us because we came from so far away and pay him a formal visit. This is a great honor for him. The lack of water is the main problem in Djibouti. Thanks to the president, the people here are lucky to have a little water and are able to grow food. In the past, you had to buy vegetables in the town, with what little money the people here have. Also, since there is water, there are more girls going to school because they no longer have to go with their mothers to fetch water from distant water sources. And thanks to water, improved hygiene is possible. Now his wish is that soil erosion can be stopped so the rain doesn't carry the soil to the sea. Therefore. The community supports the German aid, for which he is very grateful. For years, no rain at all has fallen here. When the president of Djibouti built his summer residence in the Kula mountain region, he had a water supply line installed. 
Now there are a few vegetables, tomatoes and bananas for the villagers. The water solved some problems. The community could organize itself and build a school. That makes life meaningful again and it's improving from day to day. Of course, much still needs to be done. For example, proper rubbish disposal that is obvious everywhere in Djibouti. And outside the communities, drought is still the main problem for humans and animals. The Ecole du Dai, an elementary school located in the mountains. Primary school lasts five years, and for the past year there's been a preschool class. Seven teachers teach 206 children. Teacher Ali applies what he has learned in the seminar. The activity book, Birds of Our Country, created in Germany, should raise the awareness of the people here, this time children, of the need to protect the creatures of Djibouti, arouse their interest and motivate them to act for the protection of birds. The goals of the interactive book are to learn from the environmental information it contains and to make their own contributions. Here too, the threatened francolin is the central theme. Regardless of their background, children are usually quite enthusiastic about plants and animals and curious to learn about their natural environment. Here, environmental education is not a separate subject, but is integrated once a week into other subjects. As in the seminar, the hand puppets are used to stage dialogue between the birds. People fell the trees and thereby reduce our natural habitat, which is very bad. We Franklins feel comfortable in the Forêt du Dai and the Mavla Mountains, and we want to stay there. Apart from that, it's the only home we have in our country. When we talk about the idea first, we said, Yes, of course, environmental issue is a tricky point. Can we start to change the mind of the adult? Say it will maybe be difficult. We said where we can prepare the future generation, it's from the bottom. And we move in this target. And from that time up to now, we are just uh, uh, working in this target. On I came from Germany to get to know the Forêt du Dai and also you, the children who live here. I came by plane and it took many hours. And now I'm here to play a little game with you. Here we will learn what birds are here and what habitat they need. Which bird lives where? That's the francolin. Right. Is it the francolin of Ethiopia? Is it the francolin of Germany? No. No. He's from the Forêt du Dai. Now we need three players. You must be very quick. The one who hits the right bird first wins. Djibouti Franklin. Hello? The red player has won. Very good. Thank you. I'm looking for the Djibouti Franklin. The blue player has won. Thank you. All this shows us, once again, the importance of environmental education and that we must continue. And with this support, we can do this in our teaching in the classroom. This support includes both participation in the workshop in Djibouti City and this meeting today at the school at Forêt du Dai. We appreciate that and it gives us the hope to carry on. Because without help from outside, 
we can't achieve anything. We hope this cooperation is not at an end and that we will continue to spread environmental education in Djibouti schools. The result is after a few months, these trees come out and we believe that it's workable and with the community, with the kids and at the same time as it is written in this board here nearby, we didn't yet fix it but uh, it's a partnership with many people. This we started to develop this is small part to show the kids that it's possible to do something. And at the same time, uh, the second objective of this a small area is to grow a little vegetable for the canteen of this school. And the kids, they can work with the teachers and themselves produce. Children. We now have a nursery and a school garden. This is good for us and it's something we didn't have before. Can you explain what is happening here? Now you can see something that grows, but how does this work? This? Yes. First you fill the bag with sand. So you need sand, the seeds and what else? Water. Yes, water, and then you wait a minute and it looks like this? No, not like this. It takes a week. Longer. It is growing, but it will take many years before the trees are large. The tomatoes, potatoes and other crops planted are now benefiting the children in the school canteen. Famines are not sudden natural disasters, but are usually caused by lack of rainfall and overgrazing. Also, regional conflicts prevent large parts of Africa from feeding itself independently. The collapse of the once balanced relationship between people and their environment makes it difficult to survive. This promotes ever-increasing environmental degradation. Therefore, the first step, in addition to a passable water supply, must be raising sensitivity to and awareness of the environment. Landau Zoo and Zoo School become involved on site to promote conservation projects in order to encourage environmental education and thus to conserve biodiversity, which ensures long-term quality of life. A new model of environmental education has emerged in Djibouti. It's called sustainable development and considers the future viability of a country and its people. Also ich sehe die Zukunft in den Entwicklungsländern in Bezug auf die biologische Vielfalt ziemlich ziemlich dunkel. Well, I'm quite pessimistic about the future in developing countries in relation to biodiversity, particularly against the background theme of renewable resources, biogas or biofuel, because large areas are being converted. This, of course, results in a great loss of biodiversity. And as well as that, people are driven out of their ancestral territories and receive no restitution or compensation for it. We believe that no country can develop with charity from the outside. Every country can only develop itself, with which we can provide assistance and we are willing to participate in changing structures. Structural change means fighting corruption, means creating legal certainty, that is to make possible the rule of law, but also means, of course, to support effective governance and ultimately the creation of its own economic growth. Without sustainable growth in the developing country, there are no jobs, no alleviation of poverty through their own income, no tax revenues of their own from which services such as infrastructure, education or health should be funded in the future. That's why we want to use our development policies so that our partners graduate to being able to manage their affairs in the future without outside help.
After many years of work in species conservation, which here in Djibouti has been accompanied by repeated setbacks, all partners are confident that a decisive key to long-term success lies in the education of the children and in raising awareness of the value of nature. Ich denke, dass gerade Natur- und Artenschützer für sich in Anspruch nehmen können, letzten Endes nachhaltig auch Menschenschützer zu I think that particularly the protectors of nature and species can ultimately claim also to be long-term protectors of humanity. Because without the preservation of natural resources, an economic boom, an economic development of these countries can't be achieved. And we see time and time again that there's potential for such countries in their rich nature. Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, their nature-based tourism is a very important source of economic revenue. And since Djibouti is not particularly endowed with agricultural resources and the like, it would be unfortunate if these natural resources were lost. In the final analysis, we're assisting Djibouti's economy in the long run. Djibouti auch wirtschaftlich zu stützen, langfristig.